Hello and welcome to my show, TikTok, where we talk about what makes successful people tick and what it took for them to pursue their passions, follow their dreams, and achieve their goals. Our guest for today has been called many things by many people, mostly good. Rock star, elder statesman, or high priest of Philippine cuisine, Filipino culinary icon, a renaissance man, a dirty, rotten, just kidding, scoundrel or kitchen scoundrel, also the title of his latest best-selling book. He's an award-winning chef and restaurateur and owner of the iconic 38-year-old Cafe Isabel, best-selling author, food writer and editor, cooking show host, food and beverage consultant for hotels and restaurants all over the country, and founder for the Center for Asian Culinary Studies not to mention a medal-collecting athlete in the fields of karate and fencing, and a prolific painter and illustrator. Please welcome Chef Jean Gonzalez. Oops. Oops. Hi, Jean. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Am I on? Hi. Yes. How are you? Okay. It's a long, long introduction because of so many accomplishments. <laughs> I don't see you. <laughs> oh, here. Do you see me? Nope. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. How come? But you can hear me? Yes, yes. Quite clear. Quite loud okay. and clear. That's weird. Uh well. Well, can your can your can your viewers uh, see our conversation? See both of us at least. Okay, let's check. Yes, we're both on the screen. So, can you see? Yes. There. Now fine. you can see me. Everything's fine. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I, I do feel bad that we're not having this conversation over your good food and wine <laughs> like yep. we always used to. How are you? I, I saw that you just opened your dine-in for weekends. Yes, um, we're, we're, we're open for reservations. Uh, it would be nice for people to pre-order. Um, yeah. And uh, welcome to my kitchen laboratory. This is my wow. kitchen where a lot of things, a lot of a lot of crazy concepts really get uh, worked on privately, uh, and then we move on to the bigger kitchens if it, it becomes really nice. But uh, this is this is my your test sanctum. kitchen. This is my sanctum. So what what did you cook today? I think I um, saw well, chicken. Yeah, today is going to, tonight is going to be a biryani. I made the masala. Wow. But, you know, there's, I didn't want, I didn't want some excess chicken to get wasted. And, uh, well, we're just three or four. So, yeah, I'm just doing a biryani and probably some vegetables or what. So you're still cooking every day? I saw a picture of you in every day, the I, main I, kitchen. I very much every day uh if i'm not if i'm not uh cooking in the cafe isabel kitchen then i'm cooking in the school kitchen i'm teaching the students right and, uh, yeah I'm but for now every day for now i'm cooking for every now. Day, but uh i'm in charge of cooking the meals for the complex this is uh, mainly for my daughter her fiance, who is also a chef, and wow. uh, the manager of Whole Pet Kitchen, the, we we normally uh, eat uh, on our off hours, and I'm still cooking every day, and uh, yeah, have to be creative. <laughs> right. What are the other creative ways you have pivoted in order to keep going? I saw well, some strawberry shortcake. Uh, cans being prepared for dispatch and the mango jubilee. We've converted, we converted uh, our strawberry shortcake because it's very fragile, right? And we wanted it to be deliverable, so we've converted a lot of items. Like, um, the strawberry shortcake 
can now be delivered and you can order, uh, you can enjoy it in three states. Frozen, like an ice cream cake. You can enjoy it, uh, you can enjoy it semi-frozen, like a semi-fredo, or you can uh, enjoy it chilled. So these are three. The Mango Jubilee, which is our classic Cafe Isabel dessert, what we did was we tried to recreate it in cake form. And now it's also another deliverable product. Our paella, uh, we have paella Peña, but uh, we had to contend with the problem of how to bring it fresh and good and how to have it served well on the on the diner's table. So right. what we did was we, we, we created the paella that you could, if you're alone and you're not very fastidious, you can boil it in a bag. Oh, wow. Yeah, you can, because the paella is in a sous vide bag. All you have to do is put it in a, put it in boiling water and then release it out and you can enjoy freshly done paella. If you're a little bit more picky, you can put it on your paella pan lined with olive oil right. and create your crust, your sokarat. And uh, yeah. A lot of people are enjoying it. Um, and, so if you're uh, Instagram conscious, we're also, trying, for... we're also trying to deliver food that is safe. Uh, we blast freeze our food so right. that uh, we, it, it gets in the best state to our uh, customers. Right. And um, yeah, we're doing little. We just did a, we just did a wedding. I saw. Uh, in the new normal, right? Um, so everybody's just viewing the wedding and they can see the food, but there were only like 30 people in the wedding. 30, three, zero? Three, zero. Okay. Uh, the capacity of Cafe Isabel, the maximum IATF capacity of Cafe Isabel is 50 because our total capacity is about 120. So give or take, we, we put it at 50. So we can we can do really socially distanced uh Right, uh, diners, and uh, yeah, we're slowly opening. It's been a really big blow. Uh, I, I feel very bad for our employees. Yes. And, uh, well, we we're trying to we're trying to get up on our feet. Right. Yeah. It is the most difficult time ever, right, for the industry globally. I've. There have and been periods in Cafe Isabel's history right. where we've gone through very difficult times and we had considered closing right. twice. Twice. Right. During the brownout years where generators just jumped in prices and we were operating nine restaurants and we did not have one single generator. And during the the Coup d'etat years uh, where wow. uh, we, 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 we really had it bad. The economy took a big slump and people weren't going out. But we, we managed to hold on. And now we're trying to hold on. We'll see right. how far this can get. But uh, yeah, we're trying to hold on. And basically, uh, we're, I'm more worried about the school. Yeah. Because uh, it's very difficult to do distance learning when it comes to cuisine. Right. Although I'm, I've been taking distance learning courses, government funded distance learning courses, so that I may apply for a distance learning license or a blended learning license. Right. So it's what become the... very difficult, especially because I'm a cocinero. I'm yeah. Not a <laughs> I'm not a uh, I, I can only email and, uh, that's as far as it goes. I can only surf the net. In fact, when I say surf the net, that's a bit old fashioned, right? <laughs> we don't say surf the net anymore. But, but you're yeah. here now and you managed to go on air. And so that's a big feat considering that you're 60, although you are not 60 <laughs> mentally far from it. <laughs> what, what have you learned about distance learning? I mean, how does it work? How how do you how are you gonna supervise the cooking or taste the food? How's that gonna work? Well, a lot of uh, what we want to do is to minimize face-to-face -face classes. Yes. So 
everything, all the lectures can be done through distance learning. Um, all the quizzes, they can be done. And okay. we have recommended, recommended research materials that the students can go into and we, they can copy the links and we can, we can provide that. We also uh, have to be on our, we also have to be at least once a week, we, we have to have at least uh, some time off for the students. The instructors must be able to be on consultation. This is to um, avoid what they call uh, isolation. The students, okay. when they're on distance learning, they, they feel very isolated. It's like they don't have any they don't have any support. So this is our support and we have to give them some support. And yeah, that 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 is what we are doing and we are readying ourselves for blended learning. Uh, that, that's as far as what the school is right now. Uh, yeah. But I'm also preparing for certain distance learning classes. Uh, that will be government. Uh, that will be government recognized. Uh, there is a big need for wine stewards or oh, junior okay. students. And uh, since I'm certified, I probably I probably would like to give some e-distance classes when it comes to that. There wow. are new there are new cake decorating uh, concepts that are not basically from the, the 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 main base of cake decorating like uh uh usa or what there are okay. new cake decorating concepts that are asian and we're, we're we're going to we're going to delve in this so um yeah we I, i've been trying to i'm not trying but i've been very busy uh, right it's it's nice because you can you can hold office in shorts. <laughs> <laughs> but you're still wearing your ano, chef's whites, pero naka shorts. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you also said that uh, in a previous interview that you've been taking advantage of the time to do your research, tend to your garden, reconnect with uh, your friends like Chef Bobby Chin. You want to tell us yep. about all the things that you've done in the last what five months or so well i've reconnected with some of my friends um i've also i've also uh watched people on youtube and i've connected oh. with them. uh right the, the two new popular foodies uh mark wins and uh and joel bruner they, wow. they they've been responding they've been responding and they've been watching my work they've been also following wow. me, following That's them cool. um yeah and, and i'm 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 out traveling and eating like i'm in thailand three times a year i'm in vietnam once or twice a year and um looks like this is not going to happen yesterday right. i made some banh mis with imported fillings from vietnam and even the bread was important. Everything was authentic. Right. And that's the last. Aww. <laughs> so it's, gonna, it's gonna take some time before I can I can I can buy and you know. Uh, must be I very, very must be very frustrating for you for someone who, you know, inter integrates food and travel as part of his evolution. Yes. We, we've also we've there's also a certain there's also a certain i'd like to follow follow the example of several countries on how they okay. promoted them, their their food and all that and i've been i i've i've learned quite a lot from traveling and uh this is what takes me back to what uh what filipino cuisine is way back 30 years ago, people were asking me, what, what are your future plans? I said that I'd like to see, I'd like to see and contribute to making Philippine cuisine um, part of the world cuisines. 
make it well known. I think I've contributed to that. And I think a lot of the chefs now, they're, they've been very successful. They've been, they've been promoting a lot of Philippine cuisine. But right now, going full circle, I'd like our people to appreciate uh, the food that they eat and the food from the other islands, which, right. they, they, which they have not seen yet or they, right. have, they have to discover. Right. We're, 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 we're 7,000 plus islands and there, in every island, there's something really unique when you visit it. And uh, I'd, like, I'd like the people to rediscover or discover the dishes that are in those islands. Right. What are some of these undiscovered dishes that you have encountered and gotten to know and would like them to know about? Well, the, um, there's, I had, a, I had a pancit with Dinuguan in wow. Bicol. Um, in in, uh, in uh, Roja City, there are several kinds of fish that seem to be unknown or not unknown or not well bought that are left in the market which are very good um there's so much there's so much to discover um uh, even 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 our beverage uh, there are, there are our our coffee now in our chocolate they they're they're, they're, they're all world class it right. just needs some good processing and some good marketing. I, I've, if you go to Davao, uh, wow, you have fantastic yeah. coffee there. Chocolate. There are two really serious coffee houses there. Um, if you go and look at chocolate, wow, the, 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 the terroir lends itself to really excellent uh, cacao beans. And uh, yeah. They're, they're making a, a lot of a lot of people are processing, making a lot of strides, and uh, yeah, especially chocolate. People, people twenty five years ago said I was insane because I was right. putting chocolate in food. Right, um, you're ahead of, ahead of your time. Ah, until until European TV came in and documented my work. It's it's on the internet, and right. uh, a lot of the Spanish chefs. When they heard I was I was in town, I was in the Torres Vineyards, they came over to visit and say wow. hello and said, You're the crazy guy who puts chocolate in all their food. The 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 year late the, the year after there was chocolate tasting with wine, there was chocolate in food. Wow. And uh, you know, uh, many many of the experts said you can't put chocolate in food, it covers up the flavors, it covers up your palate. Oh, similar to chili. Yeah. If you put too much, then it'll cover up your palate. But right. It, it, it's it's just a matter of being open minded. Right. You've always been one to go against the grain. You're you've always had like a rebellious streak. That's the scoundrel moniker. Where where did that come from, and why do you identify so much with being a scoundrel? Were you like? always a scoundrel all your life <laughs> what is the what are the roots of this scoundrel image <laughs> um well scoundrel probably in a naughty way you you you've seen right. it like a rascal or a yeah rule breaker form of innate rascality but it it, it sends me to being creative um scoundrel probably is not really in a in a really mean or bad way. Right, right. Um, but uh, I, I think, I think uh, it's, it's just going and exploring what are on the peripherals and coming back right on the mainstream and saying, we can do this. Right. And, uh, yeah. Um, I've also had my wild years being a chef. <laughs> Many of the new chefs now, they're, they're, they're going through that phase. And it uh, just <laughs> makes me, you know, laugh a little inside because boys, you're, you know, uh, boys, you're going through this. Boys, and girls. <laughs> and girls. <laughs> and girls. Why, why do you think the profession of being a chef lends itself to 
this kind of wildness. You said in, I'm not sure if it was in Esquire, that chefs are natural born flirts yep. because they're such people pleasers. Care to expound and enlighten us? Well, every time you prepare a dish or every time you cook, there's always there's always that uh, that um, there's always a, a, there's always a feeling of empathy that you put in okay. to the diner who's going to taste your dish, um, and you aim to please. You just don't aim to feed. Right. But you aim to please, um, because it, it 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 brings up, it brings up, it brings up, it brings up, it brings up the the state of cuisine to one notch higher, when people uh, do not eat, they dine, right? And it, it doesn't have to be in elegant surroundings, but when people are pleased, then it becomes a great compliment to. To your work, right? Your work. I remember a very young model who came out from no, the, in the, end. In the <laughs> old cafe Isabel, and in the end. totally impressed me because she had a uh, mathematical degree, a degree in statistics. No, in the end. Way back. <laughs> By the name of Mirza Season. Very well, young no, no, then. She don't say with, the year. <laughs> very young then. She was with senior models. <laughs> with, with, the, with the older models. Okay. Uh, At least my older. In the supermodel stage. And uh, <laughs> uh, quite impressive to talk to because, uh, yeah, you were, you were, you were, I, I would, you were, you were set aside from the whole lot. I would say, don't, don't say that the models are not. Uh, Exage. What naman yung friends? Ko. Good conversation <laughs> or what? But you were you were you were a different person. Nox. And here we are talking. And, you, and how many models become editor anyway? Madami naman. How many chefs become editors? In fact, you were a banker, right? You wanted to cook, but you became a banker. Because of your dad's wishes, uh, what do you think? And you said you were a good banker, and all your banking connections, I think, helped you also succeed in business. What do you think? Did you learn from that uh, totally, completely different field that made you succeed in business? Well, marketing and operations. I guess banking operations. You were on. You were on the inside. And now, when you got outside, uh, there were certain things that you you could do right. that people would have to discover. The learning curve was shorter. Then, um, I guess banking um, extended my views on cuisine. Right. I mean, the the art of entertaining, the art of bringing out clients, and uh, yeah. You, you don't ask for any favors. It's just basically just dining. And everything is just understood. When you get both get back to the office and you make a phone call the next day, there's a transaction. Right. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's re basically marketing, public relations, finance. Right. And this is probably something that uh, aspiring chefs need to know. I mean, you've... Because maybe of your background, you've always seen it as a business, like a complete holistic uh, perspective. It's not enough to be able to cook well. You need to see it from all aspects as well. Quite. Um, you, you, there, there has to be. There has to be a. There has to be some form of um, profit motive. Uh, you can't be a. You can't be a total artist. Uh, chefs who become total artists um, have the means to support right. to support themselves, or are have become so famous that uh, yeah, they 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 put a little salt, a little something, and they say, okay, this is my creation, and right. people are just wowed. 
But um, there has to be a certain profit motive involved for you to sustain what you like to do. And right. sometimes I'm reminded of that. Uh, my, 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 Especially my now. Daughter, my daughter who runs the whole pet kitchen, and she's a chef to dogs and cats. She has, a nutrition, she has a nutrition certificate. She has to remind me every now and then that, yeah, uh, you have to also think of the profit motive. Wow, your daughter has to remind you of that. <laughs> um, and speaking of that, how do you think Cafe Isabel has survived all this time throughout, or not just Cafe Isabel, but everything that you... Uh, have ventured into from the school to your consultancy. You've had to do a lot of pivoting, right? I I, I, I read that once upon a time you had nine restaurants and then eventually you had to pivot and change your business model and go into consultancy and education. You want to share what you learned from decades of experience? Yeah. Um, it's, it's the ability of I guess it's also the ability of Cafe Isabel and the school to be able to um, to maintain the pace of the times. Right now, uh, I'm in a I'm 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 in a deep phase where there's so much uncertainty, right. and I've been trying to think of avenues on how we could we could survive this. Uh, how we could survive this pandemic, the economy of the pandemic, and uh, just get through this so that we can we can start right. back and do our baby steps again. Right. Uh, this maybe is most, I think I think this is the most challenging period in in my right. career. I would say. And I, and I think globally for restaurants, I mean, we've heard news about some of the greats especially in New York City, closing one by one? Um, yeah, um, you, you, could, you, could, you could also make it into a very tragic, uh, right. a very tragic subject. But if you, if you look at it from a business point of view, there might, there might be certain tax write-offs that they wanted to create. Oh, really? Yeah, you can, you can declare bankruptcy or insolvency. Uh, and then just open open up after. The the thing is, will people still will people still remember you? Will people right. still will people still patronize what they used to eat? Or right. this is uh, I'm sure it will it it can happen because right now we're we're really just on a state of stagnation. It's just yeah. stopped. Yes. And Everybody just wants to get out of this and let life right. go on from the right. way people were enjoying and people were 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 going through their daily lives. Right. I uh, I'd like I'd like to I'd I'd like to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to be there when when things get back to get right. back to normal. And you uh, said even even get back to normal and not a you know a slightly new normal but yeah but hopefully still retaining the essence of what's been great about dining as i think jack ma said for this year it's enough to survive right and so just one foot in front of the other uh you've said that you refuse to close Cafe Isabel as much as you want. And this kind of fighting spirit uh, was something you experienced in your own life when you, I guess, fought to live and beat cancer. When was this? About six years ago? Uh, that was about six years ago. Um, yeah. Again, uh, I was met with uncertainty. Uh, so, you know... Um, I was I was uh, covertly saying goodbye to my friends. I didn't oh. know. I didn't know right. how long I had. Uh, I guess bad grass. My my friends say bad grass don't die. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I've been given another chance. 
Right. I'd, I'd, I'd really like to. I'd, le I'd really like to um, explore why I've been given another chance. How did this change your uh, outlook on life, or maybe did it prompt a sense of urgency and things that you had to take off on your bucket list? Yeah, um, there, there was a sense of urgency. I wanted to do a lot of things, but eventually, uh, like what happened now, like the COVID thing, you become more philosophical. You become, uh, you become, uh, you become more thinking of what the essence of life would be, uh, what what keeps people really happy, what keeps people living, and uh, it's you know. I've been through. I've been through. I've been through everything. Like, you know, the whole gamut of uh, fast cars, clubbing, the trapping, all that, everything. But you, you, you have to look at the essence of what, what makes people happy, and uh, I guess a lot of simple, a lot of the most simple and basic things are retained. You 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 learn to you learn to live and you learn to see that these are the most essential parts, um, especially like family. Family right. is very important, uh, and uh, friends. There are people who are who. There are a lot of friends. A lot of friends I've had in sports. A lot of friends I've had in in uh, in in my practice of karate do. And a lot of friends that I've made here in Cafe Isabel. Many of them are here every day. Wow. They, they, they've gone here every day. In fact, I've had some people who come in and, and you know, I said, you know, we're closed. No, I just want to go in. I just what? Go in. Yeah, yeah. I want to sit down on my table. Wow. There are who actually come to Cafe Isabel and, and, and want to just sit down and and you know this place makes me think this i said whatever works but the, these wow. people are some of my friends and during the pandemic uh when when uh it was easier i would i would be in a social distance table and i'd brew some coffee and we'd we'd enjoy a few a couple of hours of uh, all of these all, all of these friends of ours of cafe isabel we, just enjoy a conversation and uh, they're 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 getting pretty happy because we're opening wow and i'm also going to be pretty busy i've i've done my i've done my work today i'm going to be introducing uh i've been doing a lot of posting on on our family dinners long time ago yeah and i've been following those <laughs> i'm going to have people sample this Oh. You can have a family feast at home during weekends, and we're wow. going to offer this, and we can we can just we can consider the packaging and all that, and we can send it out. And I've I've done a lot of work on. I've already have three family feasts. I'm I'm doing one more, and we'll see if we're okay for the month. Wow, that's a very interesting product to sell. The emotional. This is the emotional connection with food that mm -hmm. you've written about in your book. Yep. Um, sometimes uh, you there's a lot of vibration that you get from a dish, you, from whether you cooked it or not. If you don't cook it, you can you can see what kind of care, or you might even right. know the type of sex of the person who plated your, <laughs> your food. Sex, okay. And then um, there, you know. I, I believe in that that novel that uh, like uh, like water for chocolate, where the emotions went into the food. Right. I think, I think it's it's a very strong vibration that you you put. You can have the same recipe, same everything, same same proportion of ingredients, same ingredients. Have it cooked by two persons, and it's not going to taste the same. So if you cook it. What can we taste from the dish? Um, well, I, when, when, I, when I'm cooking, I try to, I, I, I don't want to be angry. Oh, uh, wow. Paano yan? 
maintains isn't the, ki- isn't the kitchen to- like a hotbed of like oh well yeah you can emotion when 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 you pop and you get very angry i stop from touching the food wow i i i just i just stay away from i stop from touching the food then when i'm okay again i i go into the line um or you can go you can go and watch a little tv watch three studios or what is this something you teach your students um, the emotional well, only for those who only for ingredient. those who want to know only <laughs> for those who want to know but um if there was there was a movement long time ago about um, uh uh, there was a movement long time ago, and some people even pray, pray over the food. Oh, wow! Before it even goes out, but I, 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 I could believe that. I could believe a lot of things, uh, but definitely, uh, people will feel what uh, what you cook. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I always try to maintain a very happy. Uh, con- uh very happy con, con- i want to be co- i want to be happy uh when i cook right I, it's it's always there right but i, I don't want to transfer bad things to to the customers so. <laughs> another emotion that you're maybe not just cooking or persona is known for which comes out in your books is the l word <laughs> l L for Tagalog and English. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> in that, fact, that, in fact, you, you could say that parts of your book are actually like a seduction manual. <laughs> people people saw that. Um, there was Lord and there was Erwin Romulo. They were, we were we were having a couple of drinks, and a student came over and said, "Can can you look at my plate?" I said, "Where's the libog?" <laughs> Where's the Lee bug in your plate? So what did she say? It's so standard, you know. And suddenly, you know, you have a perplexed person. I said, you, you've got to, you've got to put in your personality in the plate. Right. Uh, though it's a standard thing, there's got to be some personality. And yeah, though you've got to put that Lee bug, that that libido in the plate. Uh, Libog is more than libido, I would say. <laughs> right. You've also said that uh, food is like sex. If you add a little love, it becomes richer. Or yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's always been that. There's always been that. Food. Food is seduction. It's right. You. You can. You can. You can add more feelings to food. Especially if you're preparing it, I really, you know, there, there's this thing that when you're a chef, you know, there are people who, at, when you visit their home, they they say, "Can you try this? This is," and everybody's staring at you while you're eating. You know, they're going, <laughs> and then you say, "This is really good." No, no, really, really, talaga, talaga, talaga. Uh, please tell us, make a critique. They're forcing. They're forcing you to say something negative about about the food. Oh, really? There's really nothing negative about it, especially because the food is a could be a treasured family recipe. It could be an heirloom. It is something that is treasured by the family. It is something made out, born out of love, and something that is maintained and for generations out of love and out of reminiscence of a person who used to prepare it. So. Is there anything negative about that? And um, you, you, I can feel it when 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 people prepare something. It, it can be the most simplest plate, but if it's prepared out of out of feelings and out of love and out of care, it's good food. I right. will always guarantee. It doesn't matter if there are only four ingredients to the dish or three ingredients, but it's going to be good food. And speaking of heirloom recipes and the heritage of cuisine and families, this is something you've been uh, championing for so long, right? Preserving our culinary tradition. And I think now a lot of households, because of the lockdown, they're discovering 
uh, that they can cook at home and that they can uh, actually what learn to cook from you on your YouTube channel, traditional recipes. Yeah. Uh, um, well, we're. Um, you said you've had a surge in followers. Um, the Kitchen Scoundrel, we will maintain the channel of this Kitchen Scoundrel, but I'm going to be changing the name and I'm going to be more taglish in my approach because I'd like I'd like to have a bigger mass audience okay. of people who want to rediscover Filipino cuisine. Right. And I want to put uh, a bigger percentage of Filipino. Right now, uh, my, my kitchen channel, I have about 90% Filipino cuisine. And okay. if it's not Filipino, it's Filipinized, like my Caesar salad. Right. Um, I'd like I'd, I'd like I'd like to have people view this and appreciate what they have. And uh yeah, that's going to be uh that's going to be the work that I'm going to be doing this coming this coming um year. And what can you say about uh, everyone making ube cheese pandesal or, you know, all these trends right now. Hey, uh, all these trends are good. Um, though you have, you had hot pandesal, you had shawarma, you had all these trends, and now you have ube pandesal, you had malunggay pang pandesal the other time. All these trends are good because people would want to discover and they would want to critique and only the best will stay. Okay. And when the best stays, it's going to be a classic. So, you're going to have a an iconic ube pandesal, just the way that you probably had an iconic, iconic bread in old bakeries before. So right. this is going to be this is going to be uh, this is going to be good. It's going to be healthy. Um, though there's just a lot and it's very confusing, eventually right. very healthy. So, you know, like treasured family recipes, there are several people who have passed and they held on to their recipes. Yes, I, I see it happening. Like even my Lola-in-law, who she uh, put up bungalow in the 50s yes. and 60s, if you remember. All the recipes uh, she passed on to their fam the family cook, but it's not been documented. So I think this happens to a lot of families where the recipes are passed on by action and by demonstrating, but not documented. What do you want to say to families who are probably in a similar situation about how can they actually they preserve have to these? document and standardize? this recipe because this is an heirloom it's it's an heirloom that it's an heirloom that uh never depreciates right it's not like a car or a piece of jewelry or what it doesn't depreciate it's there and they have to standardize it um there there are certain things that have happened to me in my life that I, I, I see why now, where a certain baker in Pampanga had me called, and um, he passed. I, I documented his food, uh, his his bakery products, and he passed them on to me. Wow! Said, why, why not your family or what? Um, well, I guess he wanted he wanted people to know what. Uh, I wrote about it and he wanted people to know about it for about what his work was and two months later he passed oh um uh other 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 recipes like um there's a book written by bunkin this i worked on two years ago and i had my whole school working on 500 recipes it's a whole book it's available in National Bookstore, and uh, I did not touch his recipes. What we did was to recreate and bake everything that he's done. Wow. And I made comments, side comments on, on, a, on a bar or a box, 
and we did not touch his recipes because I, I was so amazed. I did not sleep for two days looking through when, when my friend, we had a Kundirana reunion and said, you know, I'll give you a copy of my dad's cookbook. Huh? I said, I, I've written, I've, I've read almost every Filipino cookbook there is. I gobble, I gobble up cookbooks and I have never heard of this cookbook. And he showed me it was, it was printed in the 19, in the late 60s, went through the 70s, and he had quite a following until he suddenly passed. And we tried, and I said, God, this thing is way ahead of its time. Can you imagine the 1960s you had focaccia? Wow. You had, you had all these beautiful yeast-raised, slow, slow food coffee cakes that were in the book, and we recreated it. And wow, what a! And now I'm I, I'm being consulted. I'm being called by bakers like Henny Season. Hey, in your in your book? No, it's not my book. I I just recreated it. What what I what what you know? Or or Gilson Deacon? They they were asking me questions about about this book made by this expert. Yeah. Maybe you'll There's... write another textbook. You've written a um, few, right? I, I'll, I'll probably do another textbook for, for kids, uh, for, for ba basic uh, high school home management or what. And I'll probably do a sequel for Kitchen Scoundrel. There's so many things, there's so many things still unfinished. Um, I, I have a book on preserved fish. Wow. It's, 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 uh, I just have to add a few more things. It's, in, it's with Anvil right now. Wow, that's great. Uh, what, what's, your, what's your advice for all these families who have heirloom recipes? What's the they, first thing they, they should do? Document. They have to document. They uh, write it down, try to recreate the recipe, and try to put the measurements. Even though it's crude, they have to right. document it. And uh, so that the next generation can... can um, can redo it, can do it. Um, what's good about what happened here in this pandemic is people are cooking more at home. Yes, that's happening. One, one particular good effect, people are uh, cooking more at home and um, we, should, we should appreciate these uh, treasured family recipes. Way back uh, when, when I was part of Hotel and Restaurant Association of the Philippines um, board, we used to have treasured family recipes. This was headed by Ado Escudero. Okay. And, uh, we 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 had we had a we had a, an exposition, not a competition, but we had an exposition where we gave and we gave prizes, certificates to people who wanted to uh, show their their old family recipes. Uh, this this should be. We should we should encourage our people to do this, right? Maybe your social media platforms can be a venue for uh, encouraging people, or even uh, helping gather all these heirloom recipes. Because I suppose with all our regions rife right, with culinary wealth, might be a lot that we'll discover, right? Yeah, I, I yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that, Mirza. That's a very nice suggestion. I, I, I think we can do that. Uh, we can mention that, especially, especially uh, you know, when when you talk to when you talk to a lot of the viewers and say, yeah, some people know that, take for granted. In right. fact, you go to a province and then you start eating a certain dish. I've encountered this several times, and they said, "Gusto miyan? Wala yan dito." But they don't know the gastronomic and tourism potential that this particular specialty, it's a specialty which they take for granted in their right. life. Right. I say, you know, this thing is going to, this thing is going to make your town famous. This thing is going to. What are some examples of these dishes that you tried and that were kind of looked down upon and from where uh wow there's so many that i don't remember <laughs> I, I, 
uh, hard to pinpoint, man. but uh, let let's see. Um, yeah, there's there's a in 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 Pampanga, there's a dish called postre. Postre yeah. means sweet, right? In in, right, in Spanish, right. but it's not sweet. Huh. It's fruit that you stew with something savory like onions and garlic, and it's food for um, probably the elderly who have no oh, pain. Okay. Okay. It's also food for it's also food for for poor people who have no ulam, and they okay. can only fruit that they harvested from their garden. So there's posturing bayabas and posturing sagi. So this is a wonderful dish to serve with fried food or with uh, right. green food. And yeah. Uh, and I said, you know, pinapansin yan. Or nobody, people have actually forgotten. And when I posted it in, on Instagram, suddenly a whole slew of people started responding and saying, this reminds me of my childhood. This so wow. that's 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 one particular dish that uh, they've taken they've taken so for granted. Uh, other methods like um, what what was what was uh, food for poor people then is now a delicacy, like the tuna panga of General Santos and Davao. Okay. That was food for people who carried the banyeras and carried the tuna. and The discards. The, the discards. Yeah. Just like the lamb shanks of California and Paris right. where, right. you know, it was food for the staff. Right. Eventually, some diners, regular diners, caught hold of it and it was really good. So... Uh, there are certain things that are taken for granted, and uh, wow, um, these could or be like the dish in San Francisco that's like uh, fishermen made it. What is it called? It's like cachuco livernese, but mm -hmm. in San Francisco, what's the word for it? I've suddenly escaped my uh, mind. Serving that in the town. I was serving that in Jeans Bistro. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, yeah, okay, it's, I don't know the, um, it's not even Italian, but originated from San Francisco. Yeah. And the yeah, I forgot. That, that, chowder, <laughs> that particular chowder. Yes, the chowder. Discards. Right. So maybe well, there's so many more like that mm -hmm. that are overlooked. Well, maybe when the, when things go back to normal someday, you can, expand your YouTube channel and document those overlooked yeah. dishes. That means no, no suggestion. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd really like to do some of that. I'd like to still go around the country and and try to try to go really deeper. Right. Some people are very shy of there's certain dishes that they have because it's only eaten ordinarily or eaten by uh by uh by poor people but right. it speaks of the terroir it speaks of the, the the general location of the place of what grows and right. what people eat right so yeah uh like to i'd like to i'd like to see that i'd like to i'd like to do that <laughs> what else is on your list you said that your dream was always to put Philippine cuisine on the map. And then I think you said you realized you've given a lot of yourself already because you've come full circle, right? In terms of trying to promote it. What else I are think, your I think one, once I think uh, going full circle, that's one strategy of putting Philippine cuisine on the map is to make people very aware of what they can prepare what they have in their towns. Um, sometimes I, I would even tell people from certain towns that they have this. And some of them can't believe that you've, you've had this or is there a place? <laughs> and, uh, like, um, yeah, you asked me about a dish. It, Batangas Lomi. 
you know what lomi is, right? Yes. You know, you know that it's a thick soup. Right. But people in Batangas will get it from a bowl and put it on a plate, on a shallow plate. And oh. they'll, they'll eat the eat the thick soup from a shallow plate. And I found out why. When it's freshly cooked, you put it on a shallow plate, it it speeds up on the it speeds up and it doesn't burn your mouth. It speeds up on the cooling and you can eat hearty and eat well by putting it on a shallow plate. Oh. Wow, there's a lot we need to discover and call and research on. You also told me that uh, because of your line of knives and pans, Kitchen Pro, you've put yeah. professional gadgetry in Philippine home kitchens. Would you like to talk about that? When did this start and it, it how is it evolved? It all started when um, the merchandise of Massflex. Um, we, we started using their products and the school started using their products because we, we found very good products in, in what they carried. And they said, you want to carry knives? You can, can, can you have a line of knives? And they showed me these knives. I said, this is not the, the knife that I envisioned this to be. Oh, they said, what, what? Uh, and then I showed them some knives. And I said, we have similar knives. They were samples, but we never really... I said, let's let's take a look again. So we we got a line of knives. We we took some German designs, had it designed, and we had it made in we had it made in the Martha Stewart and the Macy's factory, where they make the Macy's and Martha Stewart knives. And we subjected them to abuse. And they turned out very well. And these knives, some of them are at the back. These knives, these knives have become the flagship of Kitchen Pro. And eventually we started going into gadgetry. I wanted this for the serious foodie, and I wanted this for the Filipino cocinero who cannot appro uh, who cannot uh, afford a three thousand peso knife. Right. And the the. This happened to me way back in, in my book. Someone stole my knife. <laughs> I was a guest chef and someone stole my knife. The, it, it was not out of need. It was a prank. And someone oh. stole my knife. And I said, uh, having a top of the line knife, which you treat like jewelry, which you, you know, it, it's like some, some Rolex where nobody can touch it. Um, it, it can't. It can't work in, in an environment where, you know, you there's a rough environment where you have to use the knife and you can't baby it. You can't baby it. Maybe if you're a celebrity chef who jets in or what, maybe you can have these knives. But not, right. not, not the hardcore people. Not the people who work for a living, who work eight hours a day on their feet and who need very sharp and very sturdy knives. And this is what Masflex Kitchen Pro is all about. And right. Uh, yeah, it's right now we're number one in the market. Um, and we're continually developing. We're continually doing a lot of development on our product. This is why also this kitchen came to be. And uh, eventually we'll, we'll be coming up with new models uh, that will be for the hardcore aficionado and the hardcore cucinero. I'm sure they're doing so well because of all the home cooking that's going on. I, yeah, uh, people are buying and uh, my, my, uh, my, my partner told us that we, we, we sold out in Lazada recently. Wow, I said, congrats. Well, pull out, well, pull out your stocks from my place. And uh, we have an outlet shop here. So people oh, can buy okay. the outlet okay. shop. I said, pull out the stocks in my place, leave a few for me, and then sell it, sell it on the sell it on the net. Because right. uh, once things get get back to once imports get back to normal, 
we can we can we can think about the the, the new models that we that are pending. Right. But uh, yeah, uh, Kitchen Pro is uh, wonderful. It's a wonderful project, and uh, people people actually people actually uh, call up and give give us compliments on on the product. Yeah. Right. With the prospects of the restaurant business not looking so bright, uh, would you have some inspiring? words for people in the industry uh, based on how you have uh, continued to pivot uh, the way you've worked and done business and aspects of your career throughout all these decades. I mean, well, once upon a time you had nine restaurants, right? And then I guess you had to accept that you could no longer have all nine restaurants open. And then eventually yeah, well, you kept yeah. adapting. We had nine restaurants and there was a long line of apprentices. There was a long line of apprentices who wanted to apprentice in my kitchens. And at that time, there, were, there was really formal culinary education was not really in trend or was not really so good. And I decided right. to formalize and create the Center for Asian Culinary Studies. We have not grown that big because my my son believes in who is who is the 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 head instructor believes in quality products rather than expand and become big, and uh, yeah, we we uh, to to create a CACS instructor takes one year. But going back to going back to asking me what what the future is for restaurateurs. Um, right now, it's a really bad, it's a really bad time, and there there has to be a certain amount of resilience that that people have to have to have. Um, they have to con they have to try to innovate. They have to try to keep abreast with the times. If if the if the concept does not work, then uh, put it on the side, Muna, and try to create a concept that will work. Uh, a lot of a lot of costly a lot of costly losses have been. Uh, I have seen a lot of costly losses that have happened. A lot of the restaurants have started closing right. down. Right. We are hanging on. Uh, we don't know how long, but uh, we're trying to hang on. Um, I have I have my employees to think about, uh, though we can only go on skeletal force. But um, yeah, there has to be a certain amount of resilience. Don't lose hope. Uh, if if there's only one thing that people out of uh, a pandemic, out of a war, out of out of out of pestilence is their resiliency their ability to get back. And yeah, we went through World War II. <laughs> I, I, I heard stories about it. I was, right. I, uh, I was very young then, and I heard stories and people were still talking about it. And uh, yeah, uh, it was a difficult time. And, and we went through martial law, which was also a very difficult time. But it's the resilience of the Filipino. We will get we will get out of this rut. We'll get right. out of this mess. And you always hope, go ahead. I also hope the perpetrators of this will be punished. <laughs> You've also uh, talked about how good food will always be important to people and how it's actually help unite people with opposing sentiments and emotions. And so there must be a good future in the business of food, having said that, right? Uh, yes. If you, if you really think about it, it's a vehicle for, for peace. You're on the negotiating table, whether you're doing something political, 
whether you're discussing something that that that's on the verge of war or you're discussing a business contract or you're among kin it's a vehicle for peace and brotherhood food good food means peace because it's sharing it's it's something that uh, people can have and people can talk about right. so, uh, it's it's again again you can become very philosophical about this but it's it's in food there is really peace and when people when people have food not only uh to uh to fill themselves up but to enjoy uh it is something that uh that emits a certain form of prosperity True. and happiness and well-being yes. what's your what's your advice for somebody who wants to still get into food today just starting out but schools are closed restaurants are closed I guess all we have is YouTube and social media and the internet. What's your advice for all these young you upstarts who want to follow in your footsteps? You have to start, you have to be innovative. You have to set yourself, you have to set yourself uh, away from, from the common, from the common, from what is common, but you have to find a way to make people understand and still relate to what you can offer. Because if you offer something really like high falutin, uh, people will not be able to, people won't be able to relate. And uh, yeah, this is a, a very trying time. So you have to be quite innovative um, in, in uh, what, what you can offer. Are, how are you trying to constantly keep innovating and evolving? Well, right now, like like I said, we we have to offer we are family feast platters uh, a set. We are we have tweaked our food in such a way that we it can be used as delivery, so people can come and uh, uh, people can call call in and we can we can deliver it um yeah that's uh that that's how we that's where that's how we're keeping abreast with the times um we we should also be able to present certain types of food that are very that are very good tasting but are simple and easy to cook right <laughs> So I have a I have a hash I have a hashtag called lockout cuisine. I didn't use lockdown because a lot of people are using lockdown. So I said lockout. And so, what else is on your list, on your bucket list, or? Uh, ah, bucket list. Bucket list. B a k i p. Yeah, Besides well, part two of Kitchen Scoundrel. A part two of Kitchen Scoundrel. Uh, we're also going to be offering more innovative innovative uh, courses. Uh, a lot of short courses in our school. I told you about the wine thing. Uh, I told you about the cake decorating thing. We're going right. to be offering uh, a lot of more innovative courses for people to start in their future. Um, we're we're also we're also going into the development of new gadgetry, uh, or gadgetry that we can introduce to the Philippine market by way of Kitchen Pro. So um, we've a lot of smashing success. Like uh, instead of knives, we also um, introduce pots and pans, silicone mats. These are essentials now. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if we're going to go to the extent of tutorials, but um, 
I might I might do some tutorials. Right, on online the, courses. Online, but tutorials, just the way we're doing it right now, maybe right. I can have a class of uh, eight or six. What's it like working with your kids who are also always also in the business? It it must be very gratifying for a dad that both your kids are not just interested but involved in uh, the future of your efforts. Well, you have Gino and China; they're both chefs. Um, Gino is starting out his new line. And his line is really more premium, um, starting out his own line. Uh, Janina is doing is doing a whole pet kitchen, and she's catering to dogs and cats. And sometimes we do a lot of collabs. Like we did the degustation dinner for the owners. We had wow, and the pet. Dinner, and every course had a translation for dogs. <laughs> and, uh, it was fun. It was great, and uh, well, she's now handling. She's now she's now COO of of the school, and uh, she she took on this job. She's helping me out. Uh, I wanted to eventually. I'm going to be. Uh, how would you call it? I'm going to be going back to developing, going okay. back to creative stuff, going back to research, going back to right. writing. Um, right. So I need the management expert to to uh, to handle the to handle the the store. <laughs> right. Is it hard to let go and let them take over? Uh, no. Um, or you've taught them well. Not not taught them well, but uh, my attitude as a coach, or my attitude as a coach. Or as a as a teacher in martial arts, uh, shows as a mentor. There, there's a certain path that you have to follow. It's a common path that everybody goes through, and there's a certain goal at the end of the path. And uh, I really wouldn't mind if there are deviations from what you want, deviations from from your own style you're still going on that path and eventually all of you are going to meet in that path so i'm 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 not i'm not too i'm not too affected by management decisions that they make uh i one thing too is um you have to listen if if these big chairmen of the boards and presidents have their advisors to listen to who are not relatives of theirs, but who are experts in their fields. I guess my kids are experts in their fields and uh, I, I should be able to listen and not force force what I really want, want to happen or my own ideas. Uh, I think there's, there, 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 there is some creativity that can come out of all of this. Right. We have some comments from our viewers from Sherry Hill. <laughs> oh. She wants your uh, pizza and your kalios. Oh, she can get it. She can order. <laughs> but deliver daw, sabi niya. Pwede. 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 deliver naman. Pwede. She can call she can call Cafe Isabel or she can text me. <laughs> Sherry Hill, you know, you, you see a little I told you about that model called Mirza Season. Oh my I've gosh. Sherry Hill when when you know, I, I've seen all of these uh wonderful actresses and actors <laughs> through the years. And, and dated uh, and dated some. <laughs> um yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that gonna um, be in part two of your book? Um I really what? don't know if I should go a little bit more more uh how would you call Expose it? Expose yourself Ever? more. <laughs> yeah, or or maybe show a different side. Did you, did you, tell, side. Did you ask uh, Anthony Bourdain why he self-censored his books? I and I did. I did. I asked Bourdain. Said, 
Tony, um, when when we spent an afternoon that eating and drinking, said, well, what what is it about your book? Um, you have normal chefs' lives go through the same rock star lives of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Sex is missing in your book, and and he just and he told me, look, man, I've been through a divorce, and I'm on my second wife now. And if I if I put if I put what I if I put what I uh, if I put sex the element of sex on my book, which is kitchen confidential, I think I'm going to get divorced again. So I said, oh 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 yeah, you you gotta sanitize the book. <laughs> How did you feel when he passed away? Um, well, I, I thought that uh, we lost someone that was very. That that would not want uh, that someone who uh, someone who was incorruptible, I would say, he he was not. He would speak his mind off. He was not. He would. He he was not always very highly praising of certain things that he right, would, right. especially of certain types of food. In fact, sometimes he would uh, he would burlesque the idea of of uh where he was but um yeah it's it's very hard to find people who are incorruptible uh it's going to be very hard to replace Bourdain but right now I'm starting to see a couple of people I'm starting wow. to see a couple really? of people that like who? don't have the same style that don't have the same style but um, they they are very good replacements for this big vacuum that uh, Bourdain has has uh, has uh, left. One of them is uh, Mark Wins. Migration, my migrationology. He uh, he's he's very different in style. Very different. Very very bubbly person. But um, I think. Um, his 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 judgment is very fair, and uh, I think he is a real promoter of food and world cuisine. It, uh, he started out in Thailand, and he's now more of a world person. Who's the other one? Um. Who's the other one? You mentioned a couple, or um, well, it's a toss-up between a lot of the. Uh, it's a toss-up, basically, of the of a lot of the. Uh, um, how would you call it? A lot of the, a lot of the bloggers. Uh, oh. But I can only but I can only mention Mark because he's okay, <laughs> quite a distance. He's he's really way ahead of everyone right. else. Uh, right. If if we're talking of a possible uh, Bourdain Bourdain um, uh, possible Bourdain replacement, right? You you mentioned that uh, something you learned in the banking industry, and maybe because you were always a good student as a child was. Detecting patterns and seeing the commonalities among several things. What are some of the patterns that you've observed in the lives of the greatest chefs that you have applied to yourself? Um, and hopefully that you want generations uh, to come to learn from your own life and how you have shaped your career. Um. Uh, there is there is always there should be always uh i've seen a, a a big hallmark of excellence there's always this there's always this uh there's always this standard that people that that these chefs have already put and have actually imposed on themselves uh this is a this is a standard they have although in the philippine setting uh we can't be too uh imposing on ingredients good cuisine starts from very good ingredients and the best of chefs 
are able to get and harness the best ingredients and use this to uh, make the best of food. But there are also there are also times when you don't get the best ingredients, but you've got to you've got to employ all of this into something creative, and that becomes a challenge for certain people who are uh, are not in the very top, but who are who are going there. I'm sure even the top chefs have gone through this phase where there's really nothing much but uh they have to contend with what they have right uh, or maybe the resourcefulness breeds innovation also mm -hmm. for the people mm -hmm. who don't have access then there's, always, there's always something there's always a crazy there's always a crazy part the there's, always a, factor. Uh, there's always an insane part where uh People have to be brave. Uh, certain right. certain chefs have to be brave, and they have to delve and and jump into that black hole, right? Uh, and see if they can get out of it after seeing what's in the black hole. Right. Um, if you're no guts, no glory, right? And, uh, you you see this pattern in many of the chefs. Uh, also, being a chef is. It's probably could also be just a vehicle for you to attain other things. Um, Bourdain was a better writer and a better show host. Uh, it's it's what fits, and right. you see a pattern. Um, right. If you if you're like to the future chefs. Many of them want to build a career on being a chef, but um, you've got to wear more than just one toque. You've right. got to wear several hats. Uh, I've learned this through and probably maximized a little of it. Um, some, some observation got me to writing, um, writing articles. I have other friends who are also chefs who got to writing too. Um, yeah, uh, I have other friends who have converted and have gone into the business of merchandising. So it's it's wearing many hats, wearing right. more, more than just a chef's toque. Right. So you you really have to uh, have more than one have several revenue or passion streams, I guess, so that you can adapt and better. The people, all these chefs follow what they want to do. They follow what they like and uh, they see if they can bloom from it or they can learn from it. What do you want your legacy to be? Legacy? <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm corny. I'm corny, but I'm really curious. <laughs> what um, more do you want to be remembered for? The Filipino chef. Just that. Just that. I just want to be remembered as the Filipino chef. With a capital T H E. <laughs> uh, T H E? Yeah, maybe. Or with a capital L. <laughs> Oh, the capital <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you, Chef Jean, for Thank you, Mirza. Um, uh, it was such an interesting conversation. I wish we had more time, but maybe when, you know, someday we'll go back to Cafe Isabel or maybe on a weekend since you're open for dine in and continue this chat. Thank you so much for continuing to champion. Uh, the promotion of Philippine cuisine and helping encourage everyone to be proud of their own cuisine and their own recipes and their own culinary traditions. I'm I'm a little curious. Uh, what the the background that you have is that a painting? <laughs> is that a painting? 
it's a painting. It's a painting by Lala Gallardo, the daughter of Celeste Legaspi. Mm. Wow. So many people think it's me, but it's not. <laughs> it could be me. That's why I bought it, because I that's, felt like it was me. Let's you and Andre, let's you and Andre, when my studio is finished, come to my studio and we'll spend about yes, a couple please. Of We'll spend a couple of hours and maybe I can do your life size. Oh wow. Wow, that would be great. Let me as get back. You... Let me get back. I haven't painted I haven't oh, painted yeah. figures and portraits for since since we built Cafe Isabel. You've had seven oh. one man shows, is that yep. right? Yep. So maybe now you can use the time to work on the next one. Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll be looking forward to that. Thank you again. Thank you, Mirza. See you soon and hope to taste your cooking really soon. Bye. Bye, everybody. You can reach me through you can reach me through IG, Chef Jean Gonzalez, or you can reach me through my uh, messenger. And, and his YouTube I'll, channel, The Kitchen Scoundrel. Yeah. I'll I'll be responding. I'm pretty active anyway. If there anything, if there's anything that you guys need. Thank you very much. Thank you and, also. Uh, remember, food is peace. Food is peace. All right, bye. Thank you, everyone. This has been TikTok, and I'll see you very soon.